And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and pleasant to the eyes, a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. This verse, it is without question, the worst moment in human history. And Satan is clapping all the way around the planet. I've got them. They can't, they can't go home. They can't go out. They can't look up. Got them. Since you've got them so they can't go out, they can't stay home, and they can't look up, I'll come through. I'll come through nestle myself down in the womb of a woman and show up when I feel like a clothed in human flesh. My papa will be a carpenter. My mama will be a nobody. And I will demonstrate there's nothing that sin can do to keep me from my people. Nothing. Then every child that's born, I'll place down on top of that child enmity. Shabaksa, shabaksa. What's enmity? Resistance against sin. Hello and welcome. On behalf of Community Praise Center Seventh-day Adventist Church, it's my privilege to welcome you and thank you for downloading and listening to this week's featured message. The message for this week is presented by Pastor Henry Wright and entitled, I Will Put Enmity, Part 1. We trust that this week's message will truly be a blessing and that God will use it to instruct and inspire you while you listen. And I will put enmity. Part one. Next week I will put enmity. Part two. And then after we present to you our new youth pastor officially I will put enmity, part three. And then the last Sabbath of July, I will put enmity, part four. And then August, I will put enmity, <laughs> part five. Are you with me? Yes. We're going to milk it. We're going to milk it. We have... begun the shift. The theme for the year is the same. Christ's commission, my mission. And we've been promoting that concept, Chris, for two years. 2005, Sonia, we, we, we defined the mission. We, 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 we talked about our need to be involved in God's mission. And then we shifted toward the end of last year, Carlson, if you recall, to the books of Daniel and Revelation, seeing the mission in terms of the prophetic end time, and then the first part of this year, continuing, Conrad, seeing the mission in terms of the love to be involved in the mission. Brian, God's love for us, our need to love God. We found love in Revelation, love in the book of Daniel. Last week, I began the shift. Lorna. First sermon last week on being a good father. Then last week, the second service on being a man. And we begin to lay the groundwork, Bupe, for the fact that the, 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 the mission of God, the mission of God, yeah, needs to be first expressed at home. This lovely couple sitting in front of me, the wife about to be baptized. It's got to start at home. And that's where I'll be for the next several weeks. Let me again state scripturally the mission. The mission is a scriptural thing. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things Whatsoever I've commanded you. That's the mission stated by the founder, Jesus Christ. 
The mission of the church, therefore, Elaine Lee, is not something the church dreamed up. The mission of the church is something that God gave to the church. He never asked your opinion about the mission. There's no text where he asks you, how do you feel about the mission? Go ye therefore, teach. Scott, that's the mission. Given to us by who? Jesus. Say his name. Say his name again. Another name given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. Jesus. And then last week I read this quote. Jazz, are we ready? Read this quote from, from Adventist Tome. Yes, yes, yes. There we are. Yes. See it? Can you see it? I hope you can see it downstairs. Let's read. Our work for Christ is to begin with the family. In the home. There is no missionary field. That's it, y'all. So we've got biblical basis. We've got the guidance of the prophet of God that we must begin our work at home. And the reason why some of you sitting here have striven with things all your life is because that mission didn't start in your home. You didn't get the foundation. It wasn't there. But thank God for his grace. Were it not for grace. Thank God for his grace. Satan has always understood how the family, father, mother, children, were to be an an evangelistic dynamo spreading the good news. Satan understood this. He also understood what God was going to do through the Son. Now, he didn't know when God was going to do it, but he knew that Jesus was troubled. And Satan knew he had to get ahead of Jesus. Are you listening to me? See, because I'm going to talk a bit today about your children. I have to get to Carlson's daughter and son before Jesus does. And that's why you have, Al, that, that, that graphic graphic painted in Revelation 12 of the baby, Jesus being born, and it says that the devil is waiting for the baby to come out. You see, that's the way I picture every birth. Every time a baby is born, Lupe, the devil is there waiting for the baby to come out. He wants to get to your child before Jesus gets to your child. Is anybody listening to me today? This thing is ripping already. Just getting started. The concept is disturbing to the mind. And God's plan was that the Jesus news, the good news of him, was to be spread from one generation to another. Now think about it. Had there been no sin, then the cycle of, 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 of the gospel, of good, the good news of God, because we would have had, no, had, had any need for a savior. So, so, so the good news about God would, would, would have been presented from one perfect generation to another, Gerald, unbroken. In fact, if, if, if there had been no sin, there, there would have been no need for churches. No need for preachers or evangelists. Come on, somebody. No review in Herald. No Ellen White. Come on. No Bible. Jesus would have been coming down every evening. The Word would have been flesh from the beginning. I've got to stay calm because I've got a lot to say today. I carry it away. I've got to save my energy. Because this thing gets a hold of me and I can't hold back. <laughs> Parents would have been, Allison, the presenters of the gospel. Think about it, Brian. You and Carolyn, it's a perfect world. So you just you would have shared with Vicky and Lauren these wonderful things about God. Everything hunky dory, no tension, sweet words passed between husband and wife. Come on, just dream for a while. Kids that don't act up. You say, this is the way, they go that way. Wait, wait, just dream for a few minutes. Yeah, no, no, no nauseating relatives and neighbors. That was the original plan. <laughs> well, we can dream. Now stay with me. Satan, when he attacked Adam and Eve, Frank... As recorded in Genesis 3, 
he, he made that he made that attack on he made that attack understanding what God had in mind for the family. His plan was full of long range thinking. And his goal, Virginia Bentley, was to ultimately, listen to me, his goal was to ultimately obliterate the knowledge of God from the human family. Satan's dream was that there would be a generation born that wouldn't know God at all. And Eric, I'm a little nervous that maybe he's been more successful than we would hope. Now, last week we studied how Satan sought to denigrate Adam, the man, the head of the human family. We visited Genesis 3.12 and, and were stirred and troubled by, by Adam's actions, which were really an abandoning of his headship. The human family faced his first crisis, and Adam refused to accept responsibility of any kind. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she, she, she thou, isn't that something? I'm going to come back there a few minutes later. But he blamed the creator and the created companion for the mess the family was in. And last week we enumerated certain, certain spiritual, spiritual and functional responsibilities that God gave to man. Quickly. Number one, he made him in God's image. Number two... He made him to be male. Number three, he gave him responsibility and authority. Number four, God made him to be productive. Number five, God made him a decision maker. Number six, God made him to be selfless, dependent, protective. Number seven, God made man intelligent. Number eight, God made the human family to be a unit. Number nine, God made man to, to be able to prioritize. Number ten, God made him to be reliable and loyal and solid. Number eleven, God made man to be cooperative and understanding. And twelfth, God made man to be intimate, emotional, and so forth. When you look at these aspects, you cannot help but feel that the family, the human family as a unit, a base unit of society, Ellen White says that all society is based on the family. The family was meant to be the incubator. What word did I say? Say it again. Of all human Relationships. Now I need to I need to enlarge on that, Cheryl. So the incubator is where the baby comes to full development. Come on, somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They put the preemies in there so it can come to full development, unfinished. And so as the child is born, unfinished emotionally, unfinished physically, unfinished spiritually, the home was to be the incubator to bring this child to full perfection in God. But if, if. The family is messed up. Satan thought this thing through, Ron. If the family is messed up, next week when I preach about Cain, you're going to understand why Cain was born an angry baby. Because the incubator had been broken. And in Eve's womb was tension and fear and regret and guilt. And so Shadrach, a baby, came forth with already a tendency, a tendency to rebel against God. Isn't anybody listening to me? So I emphasize, as you study Genesis 3, you can see that with much malice and forethought, Satan intended to, if not destroy, then seriously Cripple the human family as a unit. And Kobe, I want you to get angry as a man. I want you to say to yourself, not my home. Whatever I must do, ever how much praying I must do, ever how much sacrifice I must make, ever how much things I must give up that my family might be, that proper incubator that God can use, I'm willing to do it because I've only got one try at my child. You don't rear them twice, folk. You rear them once. You rear them once. And so Satan said, Don Pal, if I can compromise the couple, 
I can compromise their produce. What are the issues? Well, let's just say it in one simple sentence, like I've got it written in my notes. The most powerful thing, the most powerful thing that humans do is have a baby. Because the minute the baby is born, a new generation begins. Now, producing the child, therefore, Derek, in the womb is a powerful act. Ah, ah, that's a powerful act. But rearing that child is the most society-shaping thing that a couple does. See those rascals they just arrested down there in Florida? Those are all human babies. Born in some mother's womb. Born in some home. The incubator was damaged. And so now clawing for self-esteem, seeking for some form of corrupted identity, trying to find their place, trying to fit, they become enemies of their own society, enemies of their own country, enemies of their own lifestyle, just because somewhere along the way, somebody didn't take seriously, I'm having a baby. I'm having a baby. You see, children... Children were from the Lord. Eve understood this, Genesis 4 and 1, when Cain was born. I've got me a man from the Lord, she declared. That's why children, don't get nervous now, don't get uncomfortable. That's why children were never meant to be conceived outside of God's original plan. Husband, wife, then child. That order. And once conceived, they were never to be Reared outside God's will. Satan became determined that both things that should not happen would happen. That children would be born outside of God's plan. And if you were, don't feel bad. Remember, where sin doth abound, grace also abounds. No might need to get uncomfortable right now, but we're just talking the facts of life. So Satan decided, I'm going to make sure as many children as possible are born outside God's plan. And I'm going to make sure as many children as possible are reared outside God's will. And so he had way more in mind than getting eat or eat some fruit. Satan wanted to turn mankind into a corrupted race that can only produce Tracy Hermanstein corrupted children. See, can a bad tree produce good fruit? And that's why we talked to the men last week about generational sins. You see, if iniquity, see, we're born in sin, but shapened DNA in iniquity. Born in a sinful environment, but shapened by the DNA given you by your parents, inheriting the sins not of your father, not of your grandfather, not of your great-grandfather, but of your great-great-grandfather. Coming, Mary Ajari, already corrupted. And Satan exults because each generation which is corrupted produces more corruption. And that's why the Bible declares evil men and seducers wax worse and worse. Every generation becomes harder to save. Wonder why you're having problems with your children? They're worse than you. They know more than you sooner. They're worse than you. Then don't tell them that. Just whisper it in the bedroom. <laughs> they're worse than us. The environment they're born in is worse. See, sin, sin folk is not static. It is dynamic. It, it multiplies. Look at your own life. Stuff you started years ago that you thought might be a simple little old thing now dominates your life. You were just experimenting. You were just having a, having a little fling. But now that thing has so gripped you, it's become your master. Take that and multiply it by 14 generations. So Abraham has three wives. 
His great-grandson, 14 generations removed, Solomon, has a thousand. Is anybody listening to this preacher today? If I can just wonder, intersect the family. Satan was studious. He said, I can't waste my time. Uh, there's too many to get here, so let me deal with this basic unit, the family. Let me corrupt it because that's where the things get started. Let me turn the family into a place of tension and division and confusion and lawlessness and godlessness. Let me, let me make a family like that. Then they can have all the babies they want. Their babies will be mine. Let me be specific. And Jasmine, let's get these up there for them. The one, two, three in red. I want you to see what some things Satan had in mind. Read. He had to get humans. Think, think, think. The first thing he must do, Glenn, is get human beings to question the quality of God's rule. Is he a good ruler? Does it make sense to be under his direction? And some of you have friends and neighbors who, who simply don't believe in God at all. Question God and have no intention of their life being directed by God. Number two, number two, come on Jasmine. Read, he had to get humans to question God's right to rule. Let alone his quality, does he deserve to be over me? Now watch it, I'm, I'm setting you up for next week. You're going to see these things manifest in Cain. Number three, number three, read, he had to get humans to question, is it profitable to do what God said? I don't sit there all pious. Some of your lives suggest you're not yet convinced that it's best to do what God says. That's why you're not doing what God says. Well then, Steve, those three issues, Michelle, led then to several others. Jasmine, they begin to do these things. Look. Read together. They question God's holy law. Keep going. Uh huh. Pause. Pause on that one. See, do you do do you think God is smart enough to run your life? Don't 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 give a quick amen. I could point to things in your life that would suggest you think you're smarter than God. Keep going. Keep going. They question God's wisdom. That's the ability to use intelligence. See, intelligence is a gift, but being able to use it is wisdom. Lots of folks are smart. They ain't got no mother wit. They're smart, but they're dumb. Keep reading. They question See, 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 see. He simply said, Barbara, don't eat the fruit. That's all he said. In the day that you eat thereof, ye shall die. Here comes the devil. Ye shall not truly die. That's why Eve's sin was not eating the fruit. Her sin was believing the devil rather than believing God. Question God's word. Keep going, Jazz. Here we go. They question God's justice. Now, watch this one, Seeley. I'm going to bring this out next week. In Cain, see, Cain was angry. Cain would go to the gate of the, of, the, of the Garden of Eden and fume. How come I can't go in there? What right does God have to put limits on me? Eve's questioning of God after her punishment stirred poison in her womb. It came out in her son. And all these pregnant ladies we got here in CPC, all these baby-producing females, God bless you. <laughs> you must be wary. A 
of every stress that comes upon you in pregnancy. You are conditioning your baby. And then you atoms, you atoms must recognize that your attitudes and demeanors toward your pregnant wife influence her emotions and therefore trance the poison into the womb. And you become as guilty as she for this undisciplined, unruly, hard to manage little baby who is simply expressing all of the formation of uncontrolled emotions in his father and mother. I don't think we finished the list, Jazz. One more thing. One more thing. Yeah. They begin to question God's what? See, see, see. Now, see, see, see. I'm taking time with these because these are in us. We got them from Adam and Eve. Some of you this week, some of you this week, as you went through certain stuff, questioned whether God had the best intentions toward you. Because some of us are still judging God by how good things go. We've not yet learned that God is an expert at taking bad and producing good. So you put your card in the thing. It didn't register because you ain't got no money in the bank. (laughs) Upset. But now God is saying, would you please balance your checkbook on a regular basis? That good things produce good. I mean, bad, bad things can produce good. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. Fall in love, think he's this, the miss, that, and the other. And then before you say I do, you find out he's with three other ladies. Don't be sad. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Bad just came out good. Somebody say amen out there. We've not learned that, so we keep judging God by things going our way. We question some intentions. One more. One more, Jazz. One more. And then, and then, and then, last but not least, they did what? They questioned what? Now, I want to work on that. I want to work on that. Listen. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 8, that God is, God is, not God loves, God is love. So when you question God's love, you question God's existence. And if Satan's plan worked then from the second generation on, mankind would have these doubts, we listed them, about God, and become more and more separated from the creator, from the creator, and from the family. Genesis 3, verse 6. Genesis 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasant to the eyes, a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and gave, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. It is without question, these verses, this verse, it is without question, the worst moment in human history. And there's been no moment in human history since then except Calvary where decisions made had such a profound effect upon the human family. In Genesis 3.6, what we are, how we act, why we act, and where we're headed were determined by the decisions made in Genesis 3 and verse 6. I read to you last week, I read again, when that, when that fruit was eaten, the universe stopped. The fall of man filled heaven with sorrow. I'm reading from Page Arts and Prophets, page 63. Angels ceased their songs of praise. Throughout the heavenly courts, there was mourning for the ruin that sin had wrought. You see, it spread all over the universe quickly. It quickly spread. Planet Earth is in, planet Earth is in the grip of Lucifer. They knew him. He was their former leader, majestic. He was so handsome that he reflected every color in the rainbow. 
He's the one who gave them their pitch when they sang, for he sang four-part harmony all by himself. They knew his intelligence, his highbrow. He was second only to God. Remember, God is one, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So he was second only to God. And now he runs planet Earth. And the effect was immediate. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. And the eyes and them both were open and they knew what? They knew what? The effect on the, listen to me, please. The effect of disobeying God was immediate on the family. They were stripped of their dignity. Now kids can be born, John, with low self-esteem. Because their parents are naked, stripped, exposed, vulnerable. Now I can produce children that are psychologically twisted. Because their parents are naked, naked. He was doing more than taking the light off their bodies. He was taking the esteem out of their hearts. And some of you sitting here today have wrestled all your life with your self-worth. Because you were born from parents who were naked, stripped. Are you listening to the pastor today? This stuff is deep. The effects were immediate and... And Adam and Eve could not have anticipated the long-range devastating results, the exposure, the shame, and then the resulting fear, dishonesty, and more help, but, 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 but more, more horrible, more horrible. They are now divided from God. Ah, watch me, watch me, and from each other. The most poisonous moments in a household where there's a marriage, the most poisonous moments are when mommy and daddy aren't getting along. Some of you should have eyes in the back of your head because if you could see the strange and fearful looks on the faces of your children when you're hollering at each other, you would stop right then. If you could see the psychological unsettlement in their little faces, as they try to grasp in their small brains. What is this? What's going on here? Mommy is shouting at Daddy, and Daddy is shouting at Mommy. They're in each other's face, and children are trying to grasp it, Natalie. They're trying to understand it, and they begin to cry, or they run and close the door. Some of you have been through this, and you're still twisted and distorted because of it. You've had trouble forming relationships yourself. You're afraid because you saw awfulness, Eden, and its brokenness walked into your house, and you've never forgotten it. You've never forgotten it. The sight of seeing parents exchange unholy words toward one another is one of the worst things that happens to a child. And the damage sometimes takes years to remove. They, they had disconnected themselves, Robert Cook, from God, the source of the family. And they had disconnected themselves, Damon, from each other, which is the quality of the family. And so Genesis 3, 8 and 10 says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife did what? Come on, somebody, did what? Hid, hid, hid. But Deborah Sanford, they're not just hiding from God. They're hiding from each other. And I know this for a fact. Look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. See, verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? It's now time for Adam to step up. What do you read in verse 10? What's wrong with that text? I. No we. He has already abandoned Eve. No we. I. And you see in your home, listen to me, married folks, in your home in those moments when you forget your partnership, you're one. 
You don't become one at convenience. You're one. He's acting an idiot. You're one. You're both idiots. You're one. You can't abandon when it's convenient. When, when, when she acts the way you want, then she's your sweet baby. When she doesn't, she's the woman. She's yours. Period. Good, bad, better, best. Smelling good, smelling bad, she's yours. Hair straight, hair not straight, she's yours. Fat, skinny, she's yours. You said I do. You can go move in and out of your marriage at convenience. She's yours. He's yours. I heard. I was afraid. I hid. In Genesis 2.25, it's us. We. <laughs> you don't even get 30 verses in. I. Me. Some of your marriages have been like that, you know. Yeah, you know what you're courting? We. Us. <laughs> then foolishness get started. Her. <laughs> What's wrong with her? Maybe what's wrong with her is you. <laughs> and these verses, these next two words, these, th th these words in verse 10, Ron, tell it all. Hiding and fear, they represent both physical and mental separation from God. Genesis 3, 8 through 11. Well, we, we took care of that last week. Though he was the first to sin, when God came to confront the two sinners... He calls the man to answer. Remember that? Adam was held responsible for the entire race. When Adam answers, he answers in the first person singular. We saw that. Now verse 12. Read verse 12. And the man said, what? Now I'm not, I'm not going to beat this to death this week, but just remind you. Satan has, listen! Satan has now been successful. He has separated man from God and separated man from one another. He feels alone. Adam feels trapped. God feels only love and sympathy. The devil exalts because the home is now laced with a potential tension that will keep it from being the spiritual center. See, there's a reason why a lot of kids are being raised without knowing the Lord really. Because the parents are so busy tawing at one another. They have no time for carrying out the Great Commission in their house. Verses 13 and 14, let's wind this thing up. Read with me and the, everybody, and the, what is, and the woman said the, and I, and the Lord, Thou art, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now, don't miss the message in these verses. We've now got, we've now got two problems, Glenn. We have the devil now as an enemy. We have them each other as enemies. There's one more enemy. See, when she blames the snake, that's an indirect hit of her environment. She's blaming her surroundings. And so after sin... Vernon, this thing is powerful. After sin, by the time we get to verse 13, man is now separated from God. He's separated from each other, and he now has distanced himself from his environment. And these three factors, Robert, absence of God, absence of unity, and then the inherent environmental stimuli that often seem to work against us, now man is trapped on his own planet. And Satan is clapping all the way around the planet. I've got them. They can't, they can't go home. They can't go out. They can't look up. Got them. He just didn't know anything about my God. I will put enmity. I will put enmity. I sense you got them so they can't go out, they can't stay home, and they can't look up. I'll come through. I'll come through. 
nestle myself down in the womb of a woman and show up when I feel like it, clothed in human flesh. My papa will be a carpenter. My mama will be a nobody. And I will demonstrate there's nothing that sin can do to keep me from my people. Nothing. Then every child that's born, I'll place down on top of that child enmity, shabaksa, shabaksa. What's enmity? Resistance against sin. So even when the prodigal son is in a pig pen, he recognizes, I don't smell like a pig. I'm not a pig. I don't belong here. I will arise and go to my father. The Bible says he came to himself. He realized he was the child of the king, not the son of a pig. So Ellen White says, my last quote, my last quote. Come on, Reg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wrong one. Last one. Last one. God sees all the possibilities. Ah, here we go, here we go. Ready. I tricked them because I jumped over some stuff. (laughs) I'm tired, y'all. Let's go. Read. God Ah, feast on it. She calls children little mites. Here it comes. Here it comes. And you know, they're so precious when they're born, aren't they? Don't you wish they stayed like that for about 50 years? Yeah. Keep reading. Keep reading. He sees. Pause. Digest. Ingest. Your child. He sees your child. He sees potential in your baby. The devil sees potential in your baby. And so the war begins. And you, you must be that wall that stands between a parent who's made up their mind. I will do what's right no matter what. Keep reading. Keep reading. He watches with to see whether the Keep going, keep going. Indulging the child. Ah, i got to pause on that. You see, when those little rascals begin to grow up and you see tendencies, you cannot, you don't, you don't, see, you don't negotiate with children. Amen. Amen. I told you the other week, take them psychological books, find yourself the nearest trash can, put them there. The little mite is one year old. You said no. Mean it. Are you upset, honey? Can mommy do anything to make you feel better? Yeah. What? You ever notice their little faces in that moment? <laughs> you don't indulge? Why? There's something here bigger going on than your reputation or your desire to be loved by your child. What's going on here is a war. And if you indulge, then you will produce the monster that the devil desired that you did. Remember, the DNA is in the womb. But thank God, Jesus also passed through the womb. Yes. And while he was in that womb, I believe he was fixing stuff in Mary. Yes. I'm going to make stuff straight. I'm going to make sure that no matter what takes place, my word can get through the child born as a unwanted, unwed child can become a child of the God. But you've got to be willing to do the work God has given you to do. Are you with me? I will put enmity. Part one. We trust that this week's message has truly been a blessing. If you have any questions about the message or would be interested in additional Bible studies, please let us know. You may do this by selecting the Contact Us link on our homepage. From there you can send an email to Pastor Willie Boyd. Now feel free to share this message with a friend 
And remember to check back with us next week for another featured message.